Mr. Kip Sorensen, what's up, brother? Great to see you. Good to see you, man. How, how's hunting? Hunting's right? been You've good. You've been off grid a bit. Yeah, a little bit here and there. Um, we did the moose hunt, and I actually did a podcast with Brecken on that one. So that was a success. Yep. Did you see the pictures on that? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So awesome. Well, and we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, how you saw a bull, I think on day one. Oh, that's right. Passed it up. And then you're quiet yeah. day two. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's yeah, hunting. So we did that. And then I was in Minnesota and uh, I went out there a little early to spend some time with my friend and get the hunt and everything and stands and blinds set up. Um, and we had the chance to go pheasant hunting and duck hunting, duck hunting, something I've never done before. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. And then, uh, and then we did our annual whitetail hunt there in Minnesota. I was able to shoot two does. I was actually really proud on those does. Cause both of them were really, really good shots. One yeah. of them was the best shot I ever made on a deer. Uh, and then I, th I think the second to last day is one of my last sits. <clears throat> I had a, uh, a really nice buck come in. And I had, I, he was kind of trotting through a food plot and I was like trying to get him to stop and he wouldn't stop. And I finally got him to stop right in my shooting window. I'm like, Oh, perfect. So I drew back right as he was kind of trotting about to come into my shooting window. And I stopped him right in that window and I, and I aimed and shot and he was a little further back than I would have liked, but I shot. And because he was further back, the trajectory of my arrow arched up a little bit. So it ended up hitting a branch and just hit that branch and like skimmed off and, and flew over his back. And that was the only chance I think it was. Yeah. It was the only chance I had at a buck at while I was out there. And unfortunately I missed. So, but we still had a good time and the freezer is full. So we can't complain about that. <laughs> no, especially I'm sure that moose, like that's going to be like yeah. a couple of years of beat. <laughs> 400. I think it was like 420 pounds or something like that of meat so it's uh dang pretty awesome yeah it's pretty awesome that is awesome cool so yeah now we're just basically kind of hunting around here and checking our cameras and um well obviously you know brecken got a turkey because you you and i were with him when he shot that turkey yeah uh so still de deer season till the end of the month and then we're already planning out what we're gonna hunt next year so it's all good yeah i love it man yeah. love it well should we get cool. into some questions today yeah let's do it uh, so last week we had talked about some in the iron council and we did, we're doing that again. Uh, we had some leftovers that I thought were pretty good questions that I felt like I wanted to get to. So Sean did a good job holding down the fort while you were away. I think last week, or maybe was, that was my fault. Cause I had to change the time, I think. So yeah, either way. Yeah. Anyways, I'm sure it was Let's great. Get to it. Well, it, was it was great. Cause I listened to it. So it was right. great. My, my part was great. His was questionable. <laughs> All right. This is from Landon Van Overbeek. And that's a joke, by the way. I mean, I know you guys know that's a joke, but Sean just does a tremendous job. All right. Yeah. Landon Van Overbeek from uh, Battle Team Velocity. By the way, also, guys, I promise I am going to get to some questions here. Uh, this is from the Iron Council. If you guys don't. So when I talk about battle teams, these are uh, groups of men, uh, 10 to 15 men who are all working together on a weekly, even daily basis to hold each other accountable to goals and objectives. So if you're interested in some accountability, uh, a program, the tools, the resources, then check out orderofman.com slash iron council. And we're opening about 30 days from today. So get on the waiting list on that. All right. For real this time. He says, what is your opinion? Speaking of hunting on the use of crossbows during archery season? Do you feel it's quote unquote fair for anyone to use them? Should there be regulations on who, i.e. above a certain age or disability, or do you think there should be a complete separate season for crossbow season? Uh, I don't, I actually don't care. I, I really don't. I, it's very interesting in the hunting community because you have rifle guys, you have uh, muzzle loader guys, you have archery guys. And then if you want to take it even further, you can take uh, traditional bows and then you want to take it even further. You have primal bows and hunting, which is equipment that these guys make themselves. And then you have crossbow, like, and and it seems to me everybody's like, well, you know, this is the best way to do it. If you were a real hunter, this, and you were a real hunter, that. Yeah, I don't care if you want to go out and you want to harvest a deer. Maybe you want to take your your kids out and you want to do this. I mean, a rifle is a great option for that because it increases your odds of being able to go out and harvest an animal. So that's cool. 
Uh, if you want to shoot a bow, I, I shoot a compound bow. If you want to do that and you like the challenge of it and the thrill of it, because it is more challenging, there's no doubt about it. You have to be closer to an animal. Um, you have to be more precise in your shots. There's a lot more, um, I would say, dynamics to margin the way that you error. shoot. Yeah. yeah. Smaller margin yeah. of error. Then that's cool. And 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 I think you should do that. Uh, regarding a crossbow, yeah, I, I get it if you're disabled or you're injured or a lot of guys end up as they get older, they have shoulder problems. And so they can't draw back a traditional bow or a compound bow that is. And so they move over to a crossbow. So I think that's cool. Um, or even a, even a younger kid, really cool with a crossbow. Brecken's first hunt he did in Texas on a deer was with the crossbow and he shot a pig with a crossbow. Uh, but I, I actually don't care. I don't, I don't think it matters. Just do what you want to do. And if your state regulates it or doesn't regulate it and you think it's wrong or right, work, work with fishing game, work with DNR in, in your state to, to be an advocate for what you're looking for. But I don't think it makes it, it's not any, it's not any easier than shooting with a rifle. I think it's easier than shooting with a bow, but easy to me, isn't really that big of a deal. So just do what you want, follow the rules, do what you want and advocate for what you think is right. And, and it, it doesn't, I'm not going to judge that too many hunters do. Yeah. What I'm hearing, Ryan is pick your battle. And if you want something more challenging, then do the thing that's more challenging. And if you don't want to do something as challenging and you want a higher uh, success rate, then shoot with a gun and, and that's it's cool. agnostic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is that I actually, normal? Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I'd actually really like to harvest a, an animal, whether it's a deer or a pig or something with a crossbow. Cause that's fun. You know, it's just another, it's another, it's another weapon. It's another, another skill. Like I, I see nothing wrong with it. Based upon your understanding, states see that as the same thing. Archery is whether it's a compound or a crossbow. Do you know? Not all. I don't know offhand, but if I had to make an educated okay. guess on it, uh, <clears throat> some states probably see that one and the same. Most states probably see it as different. And okay. you would have to be over a certain age or having some sort of qualified medical condition or disability. Yeah. If, if I had to, again, I don't know the rules cause I've never really looked into it, but if I had to make an educated guess, an assumption on it, that's, that's what I would say. Got it. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah. Cool. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm doing questions. You're reading Sorry. the questions. Yeah. Yeah. I was this is actually kind of nice. I just want to sit back and listen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is a bit of a long one. This one comes from Ryan O'Hare. He says, my 15 year old had some friends spend the night this last weekend. Several of them left at one point to go acquire fireworks. One kid had some stashed at his house. They came back empty handed. Not sure why, probably because they used them all on the way back over. Yeah. And they were asking if they could make napalm. Having just finished Fight Club, that's what we're studying in the Iron Council this month, I had a myriad of thoughts racing around in my head. I ended up telling them that if we lived out of town and had some land like I grew up, that we could blow some stuff up, but that I didn't want them blowing stuff up in our backyard with neighbors all around. I think that's reasonable. He <laughs> says, what are some good activities that I can help facilitate that would give these boys an opportunity to scratch this primal male itch? Something that we won't tell the mothers but that also won't lead to felonies. <laughs> I'm sure I can find some land to use, but also some in-town activities would be good too. A potato gun came to mind because there is some engineering, chemistry, carpentry involved. Also be careful because not those are not all legal in every yeah. place that you live. Uh, I'd love to have a chunk of ideas that I could help execute with other dads over time. Any ideas... Uh, that could be covert service projects like guerrilla gardening. I don't even know what that is, but sounds yeah. cool. <laughs> um, all right. So yeah, I mean, potato gun, I, I would say Tannerite is awesome. If you guys have never used any Tannerite, which if you're not familiar and any man listening to this should be familiar with it, it's a, it's an explosive. Uh, and so you can go out and fi find some land and you can go shoot it and it goes boom. And it's awesome. Uh, Another thing you could do is you could actually have a fight club. Like you could have these boys fight with some rules uh, or, or wrestle or do jujitsu. 
And that might scratch some of that itch too. My, my oldest son, he's 14 when they were in Utah a couple of weeks ago, uh, went to a party and they have boxing gloves and they were just doing boxing matches at the party. And I saw some video of my son. Some of it looked good. Some of it did not look so good, but it was hilarious. And you know, yeah, bloody noses, things like that. Big deal. That that's a way to scratch. I think that primal itch, uh, hunting is a great opportunity to do that. Um, and then just exploring, just going out into the wilderness and exploring and, you know, picking up rocks and fishing and finding animals and throwing rocks and skipping rocks at the lake and things like this are such a huge, huge way to productively and in a healthy way, scratch that itch, if you will. Yeah. The one thing that comes to mind is being, being a little unreasonable, you know, kind of doing the thing that like is not safe or seems too difficult to do that you would normally not do. Right. That's part of what this is. And, and I can't help but think back when I was a kid, how many times I'd be backpacking with my brother and they would go, Hey, like we were in narrows, you know, narrows and Zions Mm -hmm. and it's, you know, it's early evening and my brother goes, we're middle of Zions, like these huge, tall cliff walls. And he goes, let's see if we can see the sun before it goes down. Mm. I'm like, looking around. I'm like, I don't know if that's possible. He's like, let's try. And so we're scaling up some sketchy wall. (laughs) You know what I mean? And it was this big challenge. Or if it's backpacking and go, let's try to get that peak. Are you serious? Yeah, let's try it. Or let's go snow camping when it's negative 10 outside. It sounds crazy, right? Let's do it. It's it's those adventures. It's the challenge. It's the thing they probably normally wouldn't do. That is kind of the itch, you know. And and there's a lot of controlled ways to doing this, you know. Like at first, I thought make pipe bombs, but that's probably totally illegal. You probably shouldn't be doing that. But yeah, get a get a black powder rifle and and talk through what's happening in that black powder rifle. That's pretty awesome, actually, if you think about it. Or create a candy cannon or whatever. You know, so there's, there's lots of ways, but it's, it's in this space of like, this is something that we normally wouldn't do. and something that seems extreme in their minds. There's a, let me see if I can find this. There's a guy on YouTube that my kids follow. Uh, I'm going to have to find out who it is. And he, the guy used to work for NASA. And so he's, he's, he's brilliant. He, I think he's an engineer or, or some scientist or something. I don't have to find his, his name, but he makes all kinds of cool stuff on, on YouTube and like projects. And some of them are explosives and some like, it's really cool. So I'll have to find that guy's name. I'll shoot, I'll shoot them a message while we're, while we're talking today and see if I can find it before the end of this podcast. Cool. All right, cool. Um, Let's go to, this one comes from Rick Vernick. <clears throat> he says, as a quality manager in aerospace, dealing with the quote, post COVID world has its challenges. People are leaving the industry in droves and we are slow to hire and retain. This leads me to take on more and more people's jobs in my role. I'm going to put a pause on that. And I'm going to say something that Jocko would approve of. Good. Cause I already know, I think this is being framed as something negative, And I think there's a frame where this is positive, but let's keep going. While I believe in extreme ownership and doing the best job possible, my management calls out the few things I can't get done versus all the ones that I do in a given week. So I would be proactive on that. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, versus reactive. I'm feeling on a downward spiral and out of control. There are very little resources to offload to, and the deadlines are starting to come and go. It's beginning to really affect my life outside of work and unsure how to handle it. I'm a hard worker and responsible, but feel I'll be a scapegoat nonetheless. You might. That's why we're going to talk about proactiveness. Where do I draw the line between an extreme ownership and letting go as my plate is beyond full? More than one manager slash man can handle. Thanks for all you do. Okay. So the reason I brought up being proactive is if you're going to leave it to your managers to critique your work, they're going to critique your work. That's what they're going to do. And that's what, isn't that what you do as a man? Like when things are 
moving along, what do we look for? Well, we look for the problems first. We always do, whether it's your relationship or the way that your wife is doing something or the way your kids are doing their chores or the way they're talking to you and your wife. Like, this is what we do. We always look for the problem first. So why would it be any different with an employer? So what I would suggest to you is that instead of being reactionary and waiting for your employer to come and say, hey, now look, I gave you all this these projects and you're not getting it done, you get out ahead of it. So what does that look like? Well, I would make a list of all of the projects that you're working on. And I would, I, I would prioritize them. Hey, here's the 10 big projects that we have. Here's what I think is important. And then I would go to your direct supervisor and I would say, look, here's the 10 that you've tasked me and our team with. This is the priority as I see it, but I don't, I don't have the luxury of seeing the entire picture. So is this correct or is this not correct? Now, what you do is once that manager gives you a priority based on the way that he sees it, uh, you have to manage expectations because that might not be happening right now. And so their expectation is, hey, I got you everything. What's the problem? Well, the problem is they're not seeing it the way that you see it. and You're not seeing it the way they see it. So how do we manage expectations? Look at the priority and say, if you're my manager, Kip, I'd say, great. I really appreciate it. Sounds like we're pretty much on the same page with a couple little tweaks. Uh, do you mind if I come back to you in the next uh, two days by Wednesday and give you a timetable and an expectation that you can have of me and my department? I just want to make sure that we're managing expectations, that we're hitting what you need to have hit, but that we're also being very reasonable in, in what we can expect and getting all of this done. And of course, I think, you know, if you're a reasonable person, you're going to say, yeah, sure, Wednesday. So now you come back Wednesday, that gives you time to think about it, that disengages you from the situation. So you're not reacting or responding emotionally, like you might be tempted to. And you come back to your manager and you say, now look, we've got these 10 projects. Here's the priority. I feel like in the next 30 days, we can get these three things done. I really do. I think the next three, are probably going to take 60 days. I think the next three are probably not even feasible this quarter based on X, Y, and Z. But if we had X, Y, and Z, then we could bump these up and we could probably get these things done. Can we have access to these resources? That might be more people. It might mean a tool or an investment. And the manager is going to say, no, you can't have that. And you're going to say, well, then... Look, I understand we're in tight times and weird times and bringing people on. I'm just telling you, without without the team, it's just not going to happen. That That is a much better approach than just sitting back, waiting for the hammer to fall and, and hoping you know you don't become the scapegoat of all these projects. Now you're out ahead of it. You're being proactive. You're showing initiative. That's that like that's a po like really really positive way to look at it and plus you're going to feel good cuz you're moving the needle and you're being assertive like a man is so that's what i would suggest stop being a reactionary stop waiting for the world to happen to you and you go exert yourself and do this in a positive way that serves your upline management the only thing i'm going to just to add a little extra value here is focus on what you need to do to establish trust as well it is quite amazing what freedoms and what success and accelerated progress you'll make when there's strong trust between you and quote unquote, your manager. And, and I think you need to own that. And so look for areas to establish trust. That's primarily three ways, by the way, over communication of how are things going? How are things progressing throughout that entire process that kind of Ryan's talking about? The second is you have to be consistent, like wicked consistent. So you can't do this. Oh, here's my priority. Here's my updates. And you do it for like a week and then you stop doing it because you don't think it's going to be valuable. Now you're untrustworthy. You're and, and I know that sounds extreme, but you're inconsistent. So now I don't know what to expect of you. So you have to be wicked consistent on your communication and how you show up. And then third, establish a relationship. That way, the stronger my relationship is with my employer or the stronger relationship I have with Ryan, the higher probability is that we're going to trust one another because he understands my character and my competence and it's genuine, 
right? If we genuinely have a strong relationship, I'm showing up from the perspective of, hey, I know that you're doing whatever's possible to make this work and don't rely on just these communications. So be consistent, overly communicate and make sure you have an established relationship. That's going to help along with everything that Ryan just said. Awesome. Cool. Very good. I was listening. I was just trying to pull up that name because I told you guys I would pull up that yeah. name, that YouTube guy. So very cool. Uh, all right, let's go to Chase Kimball. He says, Ryan, in your separation with your wife, did you encounter a lot of negative comments and lack of support from your family and friends? I'm in the middle of a divorce with my wife and it's amicable. We have decided that we work better as friends without getting too much into detail, but it seems that people around us are causing more drama than the two of us are. My wife and I are happier with how our relationship is going and get along very well. I've been trying to distance myself from everyone's projections, but find it hard not to do anything about it. I feel stuck in how little I can react to the comments. How should I go about talking to these individuals, especially the family members? Okay, so, all right, there's a lot to this. I don't know who the family members are. If they're her family members, there's probably not a whole lot that you can do. I don't understand all the ramifications of your dynamic, but it's not like you can go to her parents and say, hey, stop thinking or talking ill of me. It's just the reality. If it's your family members, I think you probably should go to your family members and say, hey, look, I know my wife and I are going through a challenging time and we're, we're divorcing and this is hard on everybody, the kids, us, it's hard on everyone. And one of my boundaries though, is that you're not going to speak ill of her, even in the midst of what's going on. You're not going to speak ill of her. And also you shouldn't speak ill of her to your family members. Cause then you're giving them permission to do the same and especially around your kids. So make sure that what you expect of your family members is the same expectation that you have of, of her. And when your family members start to talk and they're probably, do, if it is your family members, they're probably doing it for the right reason because they love you and they want to protect you. But you need to tell them, hey, I want to have a working relationship with my ex-wife. I still have feelings for her in some capacity. I still care about her and she's still the mother of my children and we're going to have a healthy relationship and you're not going to undermine that. That's a boundary that I have. And then you put your foot down on that. Now, I would also talk with her. I would sit down. It sounds like you guys are amicable. And I would sit down with her and I would say, hey, listen, you and I are amicable. We're working on this. It sounds like this is going to be a better solution. Um, I have some concerns. And my concerns are is that there's some negative talking about me. And I would ask that you stand up for me in those situations. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to throw yourself under the bus, you, you, you know, but that you, that you shut that down because it's important to me, especially as it relates to our kids. I could care less what your family thinks of me, but it's important for our kids. And I don't want the relationship with our children to be undermined. And so it'd be really important for me if you would be willing to do that. And I want you to know that I will never speak ill of you. That if my family members or friends are speaking ill of you, that I will defend you, that I will shut that down because it's also important to me that I lift you up, especially in the eyes of our children. It's, it's just communication. That's all it is. It's communication. And you can't probably communicate with her family members the way that you can with yours. So you need to ask her to do that. And if you're amicable, like it sounds like you are, and you have a good working relationship, I would actually think she'd want to do that as long as you frame it in the right way. Totally. Nothing to add, man. Just the biggest thing is, I know it's a cliche and it's a cliche because it's, it's, it's real. It's like, I think Gandhi said it is be the change that you want to see in the world. Right. So if, and, and I think this goes for a lot of men who are in separations and divorces, especially the ones that are nasty. Like I understand there's frustration. I understand there's anger. I understand there's probably a lot of questions about what is happening I know that it might seem unfair and all of that might be true. And so what, but what, what, what road do you want to take? Do you want, even though all of that might be true, do you want to be angry and bitter and contentious 
and hostile towards each other, especially if there's kids involved. Like, do you really want that? Yeah. What will that give you? <laughs> what will that give you? What will it give her? What will it give your kids? Like, what is the what is the end result? Misery for everybody. Yeah. And you might say, well, you don't know because my wife's a bitch. I don't, you're right. I don't. Maybe she is. And maybe you are too, though. And maybe you can begin to change. And you can decide, you know what? Yeah, I'm angry and I'm frustrated, but also I want to have a working relationship with this woman because our kids are involved, because I still do care about her, because I want her to be happy. And so you put your ego away and you put your pride away. I'm not saying you have to be a simp or a beta or any of that kind of stuff. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, if you want to see that change in her, then that's got to start with you. And it probably won't happen overnight because she probably won't believe you because she doesn't trust you. Yeah. That goes back to what you were saying earlier. So if all of a sudden you do a complete 180 in your personality, she's going to think, what's this guy's angle? What's he, what's yeah. he angling for? What's he jockeying for here right now? But if you do it for days, months, years, all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, let me, let me take a brick off the wall. The, the wall that she's put up between you and her to protect herself. That's why she's done that. I don't, I don't think it's, I mean, yeah, there are some vindictive women out there, just like there are men. But I think for the most part, it's a wall they've put up to protect themselves. It may not be appropriate, but that's what they feel like. And you can begin to help her take those bricks down from the wall if you act appropriately. Anyways, that's my thought. I keep looking at you. We're still going on me. Uh, yeah. Matt, Matt Atucci, Matt, Matt, Atu, Matt Atucci. There we go. Matt, no, Matt, holy cow. Matt Matucci is how I would say that. There we go. In Bedros's new podcast, he talks about the difference between struggle and discomfort. The differences are very well defined, but I am struggling to understand how to be uncomfortable in situations instead of struggling. So in a difficult circumstance, how do you prepare to be uncomfortable and not struggling? I will update this comment when I find an example and he hasn't updated the comment. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> all right. So the difference, be I don't, I don't know Bedros's de definition, but the way that I look at it is if you're drowning in an, in the ocean and you, and you've got the waves and the tide and you're like flailing around, you're struggling and it's unnecessary. But if you had a life preserver, it would still be challenging. Or if you knew how to tread water, or if you knew how to swim, it would still be a difficult, challenging circumstance, but you wouldn't be struggling and and You're it wouldn't be unnecessary. It's in your head. Just, that's yeah. what it is, right? Okay. So the way that I would suggest that you get good with being uncomfortable versus struggling is having the tools and the skill set to deal with whatever you might encounter. So I'm trying to think of an example now too. If your friend says, Hey, let's go run a marathon. You're really going to struggle. If you've never run more than five or six miles, you're, you're going to struggle and you might actually hurt yourself. If however you decide that, Hey, you know what? Hey, thanks for the invite for the marathon. I'm not going to run it with you next week, but in January, if there's one, I can commit to that. And now you go get yourself uncomfortable. I'm going to run. I'm going to study. I'm going to research. I'm going to look at the proper way to run, how to strike, where to strike on the ball of my foot versus my heel. I'm going to practice. I'm going to get the right shoes. I'm going to, I'm going to hydrate myself. Well, I'm going to fuel myself correctly. And all of that is going to be really uncomfortable because I'm not used to it. And then that way, when we go run the marathon, I'll be in a pretty good spot to be able to complete that without putting myself in unnecessary risk. Hmm. This is interesting. Would you add? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, what's the objective of this question? I don't, I don't know. I mean, is it to just make sure that I'm not struggling and, and, and I, I understand the distinction between the two. One, one scenario that came to mind is 
Um, I'll give you an example uh, because we have to do it at least once, right? So from a jujitsu perspective, if I don't know what I'm doing on the mat and I show up at a gym and someone's going all out, I, I'm getting destroyed. I'm struggling, right? There, there's a lack of competence that's part of my training. And I'm just, I'm flailing, right? Like I'm, I'm just trying to survive and it's a mess. That's, that's one distinction. The second distinction is I, I have been training for a while and I'm putting myself in bad positions, but I'm uncomfortable and I'm choosing to be uncomfortable, but I know that I'm safe. I, I know that I'll be okay. Like there's some confidence in how I'm showing up. You know, the, the other analogy I, that came to mind is like, it, you know, if I were squatting, right. So let, let's say I was going to squat 500 pounds, right. That's a struggle. I'm probably going to get hurt. I'm going to, my form's going to go bad and some bad might happen. Uncomfortable would be me putting 200, maybe 150 on the squat rack and doing it for 40 reps, highly uncomfortable. My legs are burning. I want to quit, but where, where's the struggle? It's a mental struggle, not that of a physical one. And so I, I think that, I think maybe I'm just coming around and saying it a different way. It's like, there's a level of, of preparation and, and confidence that comes with avoiding struggles in life. But then I can't help but think of Goggins and you say, well, Goggins, you doing some crazy push-up challenge or running a hundred miles. Was that a struggle or, or is that just your mind being uncomfortable? And his re response was my body could have gone more mm -hmm. and it was just in my head and my body is capable of so much more than I actually gave it credit for. So maybe there's just us coming to the realization and not mentally quitting and thinking that it's a struggle when in reality, it's just uncomfortable and we're capable of so much more and believing in that. And then making sure that we have some skill and confidence to bypass the struggles that might show up in life. I don't know. As you're saying this, I'm just trying to make this more simplified. Here's, here's what I would say, and, and we can flesh this out a little bit, but I, I think using these definitions, struggle would be you would be in harm's way. You'd be yeah. at the risk of, of, of bodily or psychological injury. So I'm, I'm trying to think of another struggle. Maybe it's addiction uh, or relationship issues, and it might be uncomfortable what you're trying to do, how you're trying to improve your life, or you might be struggling so hard that you're contemplating suicide. Okay. That is not healthy. Like you need to yeah. get help. You need to figure it out. You're struggling unnecessarily. And now you're in danger psychologically or physically you're in danger. That's a problem. Okay. Versus uh, discomfort. I think discomfort leads to action because when you're uncomfortable, you don't want to be uncomfortable. So you could, you could go one of two ways. You could get yourself out of the environment. And if it's just a little discomfort, but the, what you're doing is good for you, then you should not get yourself out of the environment. You should stay that, stay there and learn to deal with it. If it is dangerous, then get yourself out of that environment. Or you can actually take action to improve yourself. So I know like in, in this, this happens a lot in spirituality. I, I hear people pray sometimes or, or their conversations with God and they'll say, God, please, you know, lighten this load. Please like take this from me. I can't deal with this. And I understand that. I've prayed for things like that. But I think the better prayer is help me find the strength to be capable of dealing with this. Like make, make me stronger. Put me in situations that are going to fortify me where I can be a better man than I was before. Not by lightening my load, but making me more capable of handling even greater challenges and strife and adversity. And that's, I think, what we want as men, not to run away from, to use your barbell analogy, not to put two plates on, but to figure out how you can be capable of putting three plates on next time. And so that's what discomfort does. It drives you to action, hopefully productive action. Struggle is unnecessary and could be dangerous.
And maybe the value of this distinction is to make sure that we don't put ourselves in a position of struggle and and knowing when to draw that line. Yeah. Is that maybe the intent? Sure. Yeah. yeah, it could be. But again, I don't know Bedros's framing because they're just words. Yeah. Somebody yeah. else could hear this and say, well, you know, struggle to me means X, Y, and Z. Well, okay. Like, yeah. it's the concept that we're after, not the word that we choose to use. Yeah. All right, let's uh, drive on here. Uh, oh, by the way, I figured out that guy. I, I sent a message to my kids and I figured it out. Your kids actually and text you back? They Jeez. texted me back. Does that not happen like, to you? No, only if no. they initiate the, the text. Okay, well, yeah, they, they don't love they, me. They texted me back. They must not. All right, so the guy's it's name is struggle. Mark Rober. So it's... Um, R O B E R. He has 22.8 million subscribers on YouTube. Uh, so 22.8 million subscribers. That's wild. <laughs> That's awesome. So uh, I can't remember who asked the question, but he's got some great stuff. So wh- the one I'm just looking through a few here. He just, he created a squirrel maze. So this to the squirrel to get to food, he has to actually go through this maze. That was cool. Beating five scam arcade games with science. And he's got the thumbnail is like this hydraulic fist or something on his arm. And he's punching a punching bag with it. Um, yeah. A secret hiding office or a secret hiding room behind a fake office. Uh, the world's largest t-shirt cannon an exploding glitter bomb, which is hilarious because these people <laughs> will, you know, those people, who st- especially during Christmas, they'll steal packages And off your front porch, well, he would put, he would put uh, packages on his porch, but have this exploding glitter bomb. So when people steal it, they'd get in their car and they'd open it up and it would do a (laughs) fart spray and a glitter bomb and just destroy their car. Hilarious. Um, That's awesome. (laughs) So yeah. World's tallest elephant toothpaste volcano. He's got some really cool stuff is all I'm saying. So there might be some ideas in there. That's funny. All right, man. Let's uh, move back to the Iron Council questions, but we're to your questions now. Uh, I went through all the questions we had from last week that we didn't get to. All right. Sounds good. All right. Greg Ray, with today's economy and housing interest rates, what are your thoughts on buying now and refinancing after rates go down or wait for things to turn around? We have a house that we'd go on market, which could be tough to sell because of the economy. Yeah, I don't know. I I mean, personally, I wouldn't buy a house right now just because of inflated uh, market prices. I think we're we're kind of seeing the top of it and some of those pricing is coming down. The market's down, easing yeah. a little bit. So I, I don't know that I would buy a house right now. I was talking with a real estate agent a couple of days ago. His son's on my son's football team and we were talking about it and he was saying interest rates are seven plus percent. I'm like, oh my goodness. So I, I mean, you're talking about refinancing. What? I don't, unless you know something, I don't know what, how are you going to refinance to something more advantageous than what you currently have? I don't know what your current yeah, well, rate I, is, but I think what he's saying is buy houses now while they're cheap and interest rates are high and then refinance, like hopefully in five years when interest rates drop back down. So take advantage are, of the is housing. housing ch- is housing cheap right now? I, I don't think so yet. I, I think it I might end up doing that, but I don't think, I think, we have I a think while. it's still inflated. So, yeah. I mean, that might be what he, what he mean or Greg means, but I don't, I haven't found anywhere that the, the pricing is, is favorable for a buyer. That's for sure. For a seller. Yeah. Sure. And a lot of people are tempted in, in markets like these to sell, which is fine. You know, you could, you could pull a lot of equity out of your place and make a nice little profit on a, on a property that you may have, but just remember you have to replace it if you're living there. Yeah. So you might yeah. be selling inflated, but then you have to go buy inflated. So if it were me in this situation, ideally, uh, I would potentially sell a property and move into another one that I already owned until the market became more favorable. And then I would scoop up properties with all of the proceeds that I made from that big sale on the property that I have that I sold. I think a lot of the times we game this, like we, people game finances so often. It's like, well, you know, here's one I hear a lot. Uh, Well, I'm going to buy this, this new vehicle because uh, I get better gas mileage with it. And so it'll, it makes sense. Okay. No, that's not what you did. What you did is you wanted a new vehicle because 
it's, it was an emotional decision. And then you backfilled your emotional decision with faulty logic. So if we were to go through the actual numbers, you'd have to drive like 200,000 miles a a year for you to recoup the cost in fuel efficiency. Now, some people can do that. I've got friends uh, who are on the road a lot and where you look at the numbers and that actually makes sense, but that's the exception. That's not the rule. So let's just make sure we're all making smart decisions, logical decisions not emotional decisions backfilled with faulty logic. That happens a lot. And I'm not saying Greg is, I think that was Greg. I'm not saying Greg's doing that. I'm just saying be cautious of doing that because that's a trap we fall into quite often. Yeah. All right. Drew Sains, in regards to a service-based business and you're a service provider, how do you build in margin? In my case, I'm revamping my business and aren't, and aren't at a level to bring on support for client delivery and want to ensure my numbers are solid when I get to that point, um, full capacity, uh, not in a full capacity though, was a comment that he made. I think you're probably better to answer this question, but here is one thing I would say. I would test personally. I would test. I would see what the market was willing to pay. So, uh, you increase your prices over time and see where the threshold is. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So maybe you start a little lower than you would think. And where do you start? Well, I think you look at industry competitors. You look at what other people are charging. Uh, you look at for for similar products, maybe not in the same space, but similar what people are willing to pay for. Uh, and you look at ways to add additional value that isn't real cost intensive for you. Like the Iron Council, we, we're, we're putting together courses and programs and making courses available. That's not going to be real cost heavy for us, but it's immensely valuable for iron council members. So the, the, the investment of being an iron council begins to make more and more and more sense. But I I would test is kind of what I would say and increase prices over time. And you'll figure out where that threshold is. Yeah. Most service-based businesses, right. We're, we're talking typically probably time and materials, right. And so your margins obviously come down to the cost of resources and all the support versus what you charge, right? From a rate perspective. Um, So obviously test the market, see if your rates are right. The other part of this is focus on intellectual property, right? And it's interesting because um, if I provide service X, Y, Z and I start getting really good at it, well, then I get more efficient at it. And on a time and materials, I'm charging less, right? Something that took me 10 hours now takes me five, but yet I'm not recouping and charging for the experience and the know-how that allows me to get it done in five, right? So look for opportunities to make that IP or intellectual property where it's like, okay, well, instead of doing XYZ service, we're going to package that up. And now that's a fixed bid or a fixed price solution we provide. And now we get it done in two hours because we have all the documents and the templates and everything that allows us to be highly efficient. And now our margins get higher and higher, right? So, and there's a balance there, but look for fixed price, intellectual property packaged kind of products where you get the benefit of being more efficient versus charging the time and materials. And then the other thing I would focus on is I worked for a consulting firm back in the day and we were primarily just a project-based service provider. And the problem with projects is it just ebbs and flows, right? It's just like, we're swamped, we're light, we're swamped, and it's just inconsistent cash flow. And um, during that time, we focused on having a reoccurring service that we offered on a monthly basis and then locked in clients into like a six-month contract And by doing that contract, they would get our professional services at a discounted rate. So I'll give you an example. Ryan comes to me and says, hey, Kip, we need your team to do X, Y, Z. I'd be like, awesome, we'll do that project. However, Ryan, if you have a service contract with us already in place, you get our professional services team at a discounted rate. Do you want to sign up for a support contract first for six months? And he goes, yeah, for sure. So now we have reoccurring flow of cash for six months from Ryan. He gets a discount on the project. And then we're also staying involved with that client. So we have constant communication. So that way, next time Ryan needs help, 
he hasn't forgotten about us. Why? Because we're servicing and helping him on a monthly basis. So yep. now we're almost like foot in the door for all future work. Yeah. I mean, the monthly, the monthly retainer or monthly subscription or whatever you want to, is a, is a great month. Again, iron council, same yep. way, <laughs> monthly, monthly basis. I have a baseline revenue. Uh, and then we have other ancillary products and offerings that are available, but that's, that's a healthy baseline revenue. You know, as you were talking about this, um, I was reminded of a story I heard once and I just pulled it up cause I didn't want to butcher it. And it's called, you can call it whatever you want, ship repairman story. So, so here it is. A giant ship's engine failed. The ship owners tried one professional after another, but none of them could figure out how to fix the broken engine. Then they bought, brought in a man who had been fixing ships since he was young. He carried a large bag of tools with him, and when he arrived, immediately he went to work. He inspected the engine very carefully, top to bottom. Two of the ship's owners were watching this man, hoping he would know what to do. After looking things over, the old man reached into his bag and pulled out a small hammer. He gently tapped something. Instantly, the engine lurched into life. He carefully put his hammer away, and the engine was fixed. A week later, the owners received an invoice from the old man for $10,000. What? The owners exclaimed. He hardly did anything. So they wrote the man, please send us an itemized invoice. The man sent an invoice that read, tapping with a hammer, $2. Knowing where to tap, $9,998. <laughs> effort is important, but experience in knowing where to direct that effort makes all the difference. Guys, the reason I read that story to you is I don't ever want you to discount your expertise. And that's what we're tempted yeah. to do is just because it, I spent you know 10 minutes tapping with his hammer doesn't mean that I get to discount because it costs me a lot of time, energy, resources, and money. There's another thing that you need to know about abundance. And this is very, very important. I'm going to use from the Iron Council. And we're pretty transparent with the way that we make money and, and revenue and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, and if you actually want it, people, people like calculate it and they send it to me. They're like, I can't believe you're making this much money. <laughs> Here's the interesting thing about what we do is that it doesn't cost me any it, a little bit but it's not proportionate it doesn't cost me much more to have 100 members than it costs to have 10 members a little bit more but not not directly proportionate okay so because that's the case people will say well then you should charge less why should i charge less it doesn't matter if i have 10 people or 10,000 it's still the same value to that one individual. And it really doesn't matter what my cost is relative to what that one individual is getting. So be careful because there's a lot of loser mentality out there. There's a lot of poverty mentality that will say, well, you know, 10,000 times $90 a month. Here's how much you're making. Okay. Yes, technically that's right, but I don't need to discount because I have 10,000 versus 10 and all the time, the energy, the experience, and people will say, well, I could do that. Then do it. If you can do that, then you go do it, but don't let other people discount what it's taken you to get there. I have people say all the time, things like, well, you know, I wish I could dink around on Facebook all day. You can, you can do that. You 100% can do that. And if you think that's what I'm doing, then I would encourage you to do that and make all the wealth and abundance of prosperity and helping other people that we are here. And I'm not even saying that sarcastic. I'll help you. I will tell you what yeah. to do, but there's a lot more that you don't see. So don't ever discount uh, your services. Your, your And I'm not saying physically discount. I'm saying don't ever overlook the value that you offer. Yeah. I working for myself for over 15 years, I, I can't count how many times I was like, there's no way the client's going to pay this much, right? There's no way. And in hindsight, I, I laugh at what those rates were and what I actually thought was too expensive. Like yeah. I never overprice myself ever. It's usually always the opposite to your point. And there's a big difference between a relationship with a client that's willing to pay your premiums versus a client that is um, stingy and, and working from a scarcity mentality. Those are the worst clients. Yeah. The, the project is less efficient. We will not, we will not get done as fast. They constantly push back. They become red tape in the process. They generate huge inefficiency, right? Like 
no joke. It's like a red flag for me when I hear a client go, oh man, you guys' rates are too high. Could we discount? I'm like, you're not our client, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. we need the client that says, hey, we're willing to pay whatever necessary at the high rate to get the best services possible. I don't want the client that goes, let us micromanage you through this entire process so we can reduce the cost as much as possible. They actually will double the timeline of what it will take to actually complete a project because they're because of the lack of trust and the scarcity that they have. Well, not to mention, you know, if you could take on one client and make, you know, five times the amount. So I'm losing money. two scenarios. Yeah. Well, you're losing money, but it's not just money. It's your, your time. You know, if I could work with one client and make, I, here, here's how it's it. I would rather work with one client and make $10,000 than five clients and make 2000 on each of them. Yeah. Like that's just, I mean, that's just common sense. Now there is a risk to that. And the risk is you lose the one client. Yeah. So there is that risk, but that's why you go pick up five or 10 clients at 10,000 and not 50 at, you know, 2000, whatever the math is there. Yeah. Totally. All right. Ryan, uh, Umagat, Umagat, sorry, Ryan, from an, from a man of faith perspective, when at a crossroads or faced with a tough decision, how do you know you are listening and following God's path and plan, as opposed to acting out on your own emotions or even out in direction or direct rebellion to God's plan? It can be hard to discern God's voice from our own desires. And God may even remain silent on purpose from time to time. I would say that if you are only reaching out to God when you need something, it's going to be more likely that you're doing life on your own. Hmm. If you're only asking. <laughs> then how do you know? You don't know him. So imagine this. Hmm. Imagine, um, imagine a stranger that you have an interaction with. Maybe it's a, a pr prospect or a new client or you know, a, a waitress at the, uh, oh, excuse me, I can't say waitress, a server at the, at the restaurant. You have an interaction with somebody you don't know. And that person is behaving a certain way. And you're interpreting that behavior. That's what we do. And you think, man, that person's a real jerk. Okay, now let's take the same scenario. And that server is your wife. And you guys are struggling financially because you just got laid off and she just had a miscarriage and she's at work trying to make ends meet, knowing that she just lost her baby. Are you going to say she's a jerk? Her behavior might look the same from a casual outside observer, but are you going to think the same thing? No, of course not. Cause you understand the context of what's happening. And if anything, you're going to be more gracious. Maybe you leave a larger tip. Maybe you're kinder than you would normally be, right? So you, because you know that person. And so I would say the same thing with this question about God. If you're only going and God's a stranger to you, then odds are you're misinterpreting his message or his lesson. But if you know him, and you pray to him and you read scripture and you go to church and you're around other people who are intimately familiar with God and he's an integral part of your life. Then when these challenging and difficult circumstances arise, you lean on your knowledge of him. Then it's probably more likely that you're following his path and not your own. Yeah. Hmm. I, I actually always struggle with these questions because I, I think, I don't know, I, I, I fall in the path that that um, I think our creator kind of sits back and, and, and lets us learn our lessons, you know, and that there's there's little uh, disruption, you know what I mean, to the flow of things and, and probably to a fault. I know that. Um, but but one one thing I would consider is it is it in line with his plan. And if it's not, then <laughs> why would you even ask? You know what I mean? Like, is well, but you is don't this... know his plan. I know, but plan, aka, is it about 
like the service of other individuals or is it about you? And, yeah. and the probability is if it's just about you, he's probably indifferent. <laughs> but if it's about serving other individuals, it's about a greater good. It's about something beyond yourself. Then, then those, those have different weight in my mind. So I used to, up until even relatively recently, wholeheartedly agree with that. But I'm trying to see if things a little different. I don't know that he's indifferent. Hmm. It's well, just that it's kind of, yeah. Yeah. It's just that he may not answer you the way that you want. Let me give you an example. When I was young, um, before internet and computers, <laughs> I remember I'd have to work on a school project, you know, write a report or something on alligators and whatever. And I would ask my mom, mom, how do you spell alligator? And she would say, instead of spelling the damn word, which I knew she was fully capable of spelling the word for me, she would say, go look it up in the dictionary. And we actually had to look it up in a dictionary or the encyclopedia. Like we had to open a book. This is crazy. Open a book that had like A through C words and we'd have to like go through and find it and then figure out how to spell it. And it was so infuriating. I'm like, mom, just tell me how to spell alligator. She's like, no, I, I'm like, cause you don't, yeah, I would try that. Right. I'm tempter. Well, because you don't know how to spell it. And that never worked because she didn't need to prove anything to me. Yeah. And, and so she said, no, I'm not, I want you to know how to find it and figure it out. And so Ine inevitably I'd have to go look it up and, but that's our relationship with God. So we're like, God, please help this woman love me or please help me get this promotion or please help me whatever. And you don't get what you want. You don't get the promotion. You don't get the woman. You don't get whatever. And you're like, oh yeah, see, there's no God. Like you couldn't, how, how powerful are you? You couldn't even give me what I wanted. And so you tempt him and he doesn't answer because he doesn't need to prove anything to you. And then you fast forward your life 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. And you're like, man, I'm really glad that God didn't answer that prayer the way I wanted him to answer it. Cause oh. I would not have what I have right now. If that were the case, he knows just like my mom knew how to spell. He knows our plan is imperfect. And that sucks actually because we're not yeah. as in control, but I don't think he's indifferent. It doesn't sound like you actually think no. that either, but yeah. Well, and what's fun on what's fun about this is um, to drive this thought home. Your mom spelling alligator for you doesn't help you learn how to spell alligator. That's what I'm saying. That's but you, the point, but you figuring it out does right. That and, helps. and the perfect, prime example of that is the fact that that's why the Bible is whittled with parables because you need to figure out the meaning because there's a big difference being told something versus you figuring it out. Right. And a quote that uh, came up on my Instagram actually yesterday or, or earlier this uh, last week, late last week from Dale Carnegie. And I think it's, it's relevant to this. It says, you cannot teach a man anything. You can only help him find it within himself. That's how we learn. We don't learn because Ryan told me X, Y, Z. I learned because he said some things and I had to internalize it and think through it. And then that becomes wisdom and knowledge. Before that, it was just intellectual understanding or logic. And those are two drastically different things. And thus the reason for parables. So that way we could have a, a different connection to that knowledge by coming to that realization on our own. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the knowledge versus wisdom. You know, you can have knowledge of something without being wise. Cause I think wisdom is practical application of knowledge. Yeah. It uh, Again, we can always tie it back to jujitsu. I could know how to do a Kimura. Like I could know all of the steps, all of the ways that the, the proper technique I could know all of that. I could even know, I could even know Kip when you're going to do it to me. I can know. I'm like, oh, he's trying to go for a Kimura because of how he's positioned, how he's got my arm. I, I know that. And yet I can't defend it or I can't submit somebody with it because there's nuance to the game that you need to do it enough to realize. And by the way, just because it doesn't work, 
for you doesn't mean it doesn't work. You need to go back to the drawing board because you might be missing a crucial step. I hear that a lot. Guys are like, oh yeah, I tried to start a podcast, but it didn't work. Really? Podcasting doesn't work? You're, you're, you're telling me that podcasting doesn't work. Like, how can you look me straight in the eye and say that in all a guy who's created a very, very successful podcast that podcasting doesn't work? It's not that it doesn't work. It's that you're not doing something correctly, which is okay, but it's not an opportunity to throw in the towel. It's an opportunity to learn and grow and develop and figure out that one little key thing you might be missing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It kind of deviated from the question, but at the end of the day, I think yeah. if you know God, you're more likely to be following God. If he's a stranger to you, you, how do you know? How do you know if you're following his plan or not? You really don't because you have nothing to compare it to. Yeah. All right. Take, last uh, question. One more, is that cool? Yeah, sure. Let's do All one right. more. Brandon uh, Ballard, what are some strategies for dealing with burnout in groups or activities that have brought you joy in the past, but now you are finding them less engaging? Yeah, I, I saw this question beforehand. I have a very easy answer. Elevate yourself in the group. Stop being a bystander. Stop being a participant. If something brings you joy or has brought you joy, uh, here's the thing. I don't know. When he said this, I kind of wondered if he was talking about the Iron Council a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, my thought too is like, oh, I'm on a battle team. It's not yeah. as engaging as it used to be. Yeah. Right. And I don't know if that, but we're just assuming that, but I read it. I'm yeah. like, oh, I wonder if he's talking about the Iron Council. He says strategies for dealing with burnout in groups or activities that have brought you joy in the past. Now they're monotonous and less engaging. The answer is to get engaged and not just for your own benefit, but for the benefit of other people. So if you see something in the Iron Council or other activities or groups that you belong to that brought you joy, it might not mean that they're joyless. It might mean that you have, you have graduated past participant. And now your new role is not simply to participate, but you to serve other people. It's like you get to this peak and you're like, oh, this peak is beautiful. And then you stand there. Have you ever gone on a big hike? You were talking about Zion. Angel's Landing is a great hike in Zion National Park. And you hike and you go up the switchbacks and you go up the little narrow trail and you're holding onto the chains and you get to the top and you're like, this is beautiful. Well, how long is it beautiful for? Half an hour? Yeah. And then you're like, yeah, I get it. There's a lot of rocks up here and it's high. Like I'm ready to go down now. Why? It's It's beautiful. By any objective standard, you get up there, you should be proud of it. It's a challenging hike. It's pretty scary. Uh, and it's beautiful. And yet after a half an hour, you're like, all right. Yeah. Got Next. it. Yeah. <laughs> you have gone past casual observer or casual participant, and you should be graduating into the guy that now helps somebody else. Hey, you know, this is missing, but I think it could be added. And here's one thing we can do. And if we did this, I think it would improve engagement. And there you're going to find an entirely new meaning of your battle team, of the Iron Council, of your work, of your relationship, of your church congregation, of your school board, of your football team that you coach, an entirely new dynamic that you are unlocking if you get over the idea that everybody else is just there to serve you. And maybe your new role is now to serve other people, which is pretty exciting. So look at it that way. Sure. Love it, man. All hey, right. So we, wrap it up. we covered a couple things. Yeah. So I see we're going to open that up uh, here in the coming weeks. So to get connected and to learn more about the Iron Council in preparation for when we open that up, go to orderofman.com slash Iron Council. Holidays are coming up as well. So if there is swag that you're wanting to get yourself or another brother or your son, or if you're the spouse that's listening and you want to get some swag for your husband, go to store.orderofman.com and get those let me orders make a, in before the holiday season rush. And let me make a plug on one thing that's big right now is we have signed copies of my newest book, The Masculinity Manifesto. And we also have, I think, a few more copies of our exclusive edition, which is a custom leather bound journal over the book custom uh, leather um, bookmark, uh, a personalized note card from me. And those are available as well. It's all at store.orderman.com.
Perfect. And then to connect with Mr. Mickler on Instagram and Twitter, go to at Ryan Mickler and stay connected that way as well. Right on. Thanks, Kip. Appreciate you guys. Great yep. questions today. Keep them coming. We'll keep answering and uh, we'll keep going. Uh, we'll be back on what day? Friday. <laughs> Friday. And uh, until then, guys, go out there, take action, become the man you are meant to be.